Welcome to Dr. B Music Theory. I had a question from one of my Patreon subscribers, and it was pretty involved with lots of different sub-questions. And I wanted to go through point by point and answer them because I think they're, they set a context for why we learn music theory, how it works. It's more of a, a philosophical series of questions that, that, that I've touched upon in some of my other lessons, but this is an opportunity to really delve a little bit deeper into answering those points and questions. So, question number one, and this is from Michael, he says, why does diatonicism work? So diatonic, uh, just as review, we're talking about the notes that are within a specific scale. So, we always want to make sure we know our terms. So, diatonic scale, so for instance, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. This C major scale, if, if a piece of music only uses the notes of that major scale, it is called diatonic. So why does diatonicism work is the question. And he, he, he goes on further to say, why can I instantly hear when a note is played out of key when playing scales, for example, or also more conventional music? My gut tells me it's because we are organizing music around the overtone series in tonal music. This is correct, by the way. And by constantly reinforcing the tonic with the one chord, we continually we are continually reaffirming this organization. Also true. And balancing against this, it's how we hear something and then come to expect it. Expectation is another critical point. So it feels right versus feels wrong, which I guess must be related to our language. So let me go point by point. So absolutely, um, the overtone series and, and is, is a big component of that. So overtone series, and when we're talking about that, we're, we're talking more generally about acoustics, how sound works. That's what we're talking about. So that's one critical component. Um, and the most critical component is to understand what the overtone series is. So, if you have, let's say, a pitch C, this is called the fundamental. This is the pitch you would hear. So if I play this on the piano, you're hearing this pitch, you're hearing this fundamental. If I sing this note, I sing the same fundamental. However, you can tell the difference between the, pian the sound of the piano and the sound of my voice, just as you would be able to tell there, there's a difference if a trumpet played that note or a flute. How is it that you can tell the difference of these different instruments playing the exact same fundamental pitch? And the answer is that each of these fundamental pitches has overtones that vibrate along with it. And Every instrument has a slightly different ratio or mix of how intense those different overtones are. This is what gives us timbre or how things sound. So there is a connection between the, the obvious connection between the overtones and how intense each one of them is and what it sounds like, what instrument it sounds like. So if you're hearing this fundamental, what happens next is you get this overtone, a C, an octave higher. That's the first overtone. After that, you get a G, that's the second overtone. Then a C, the third overtone. Then an E, the fourth overtone. And finally, a G, which is our fifth overtone. And the overtone series continues beyond that, but that's our fundamental and first five overtones. So like I was saying, if we have, let's say, a, a flute, the, the intensity of overtone one, two, three, four, five is going to be different, like how loud each one is. You know, so you can think like, what, am I, what percentage of volume each one of these is. It's gonna be different for the different instruments, even though you hear the same fundamental pitch. So this overtone series is, is kind of like the science of, of sound, of music. And when we're talking about these fundamentals, I should also point out sound is a, a broader category than what I'm just talking about here. So we have sound, and within sound there's two 
obvious categories. One is pitched, and the other is noise or non-pitch, right? So pitched sound has a, a periodic vibration. So if you kind of like analyze it, it vibrates at, in a, a, a certain amount of times per second, and it's, it's kind of regular. Whereas noise ends up being a more erratic uh, sound wave if you analyze it. So if you think about sound as the big category, we can narrow it down to two different kinds of sound. Pitched sound versus non-pitched, or we would say noise. We're talking about, when we're talking about music, we are talking about most often about pitch. So certainly when we're talking about a fundamental and overtones, this is unique to pitched sound. So absolutely, a lot of, of uh, what, you know, if you're asking why something works a certain way in terms of music theory, this is, this is it, right? This is a big component of it. It's not the entire, right? So first off, there's, there's sound. This is like science. This is outside of human beings. It exists. If a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? Of course it does. The fact that a human being's not around to hear it doesn't make a difference. So there's that objective science of sound that we're talking about acoustics and the overtone series. And there's a lot of things we can learn by about music and about music theory by examining this overtone series. For example, you know, you'll notice that if we add these all up, it makes a C major triad. Coincidence? Absolutely not. So and we'll, we'll talk more about that. The other component of, of all of this, the other big, big side of, of this is how, the, the, the acoustics work with human perception, right? So as human beings, the overwhelming majority of us have a certain way in which our, our ears perceive sound and our brains process that. Okay, so there's human perception that goes into how our minds work. Uh, there's certainly a, a psychology of how this works. And both of those things are, are kind of like given, they're objective. It doesn't matter what point in history you are in, human history, uh, what culture you're talking about. We are all human beings. We all have the same essential hardwire mechanism to perceive and process music. So that's a big, a big part of like, well, why do you hear diet? Well, how did, why does diatonicism work? Why, why can you instantly tell when a note is out of key? It has to do with the combination of acoustics and human perception and, and processing of that. So that is part of it. The other part, so we have acoustics being the big part, human perception, psychology, and then expectation. And this has to do with repet often with repetition. So if you, uh, if you repeat something, it becomes familiar and then it, it, it can act as uh, a tonal center for you. And, and composers early on in history, we have like the major triad being the most common tonal center, place of rest, place of resolution. And as music progressed, composers figured out ways to, to be a little bit more creative with that, kind of stretch the boundaries. And so you have seventh chords eventually becoming tonic harmonies uh, when you get later in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And so those are established. So, and even people like us, uh, Alexander Scriabin, uh, a Russian composer, uh, wrote a piece uh, called uh, Verse La Flamme. Uh, may... And I'm going to play just the beginning of that here. It starts off like this. You have a whole piece and and that's a very dissonant chord to start with but because Scriabin repeats it so many times and it's rhythmically placed in a very strong uh, on a strong beat 
the human ear, human perception, starts saying, oh, this is my point of reference. You know, it doesn't matter that it's very dissonant. It, be, it becomes your point of reference. So one of the beautiful things about music is the, the almost the, the huge number of possibilities and how you can deal with acoustics, deal with human perception and, and the processing of how our minds hear music and repetition and play with all these different aspects of music to have so much variety. It's, it's, it's amazing. So part of, of what this does is it creates um, tension, relaxation. And this is really at the heart of uh, what makes music create the emotions uh, and, and inspire emotions. The, it's almost, if I were to make an analogy, it's kind of like your ear hears dissonance. And when it hears it resolve to consonants, there's a sense of satisfaction. It's kind of like if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and you have an idea of what the picture is supposed to be, but when you start sliding in those last bunches of pieces, there's a great sense of like, oh, the world makes sense. This puzzle makes sense. It's everything in its right place. And that, that, that is somewhat equivalent to what happens in music where these dissonant notes that do not blend together, do not mesh together, then get go through these permutations until they do kind of harmonize. And like I mentioned with Scriabin, there's ways to like play with that, where you can make the dissonance almost feel like a consonant through repetition and through rhythmic placement. But that ebb and flow of tension and relaxation, dissonance and consonance, is at the heart of what makes music emotional. So let's, let's go back to these questions and see how I've done. Um, there's other factors that go into answering Michael's question. So for instance, uh, right now I've been talking about kind of the objective side of music, the thing that's the universal side of music, which absolutely exists. But there's also a completely subjective side of music at two different levels. One is the cultural level and the other is the personal level. So for example, um, a piece of music can create an emotion. And I, as an individual, Dr. B, can say, you know what? I don't particularly like that emotion. I don't like that feeling. I don't like that sensibility that this piece of music is creating. Where another person who has had a different life than I could listen to it and say, wow, I really like this. I like the emotions being created here. It, it, it makes sense to my sensibilities and my emotional scheme. So there's a very, very personal subjective side of whether you like or dislike music um, that has to do with, with the, the kind of emotion that's being expressed. The other aspect is there are cultural things. So as a culture, a, a culture as a whole will have certain ideas of what it believes is right and wrong, moral, immoral, what, what is appropriate or inappropriate. So if you go through different points of human history, you can obviously see that people had certain priorities at one point in history and those priorities change or what's important becomes different. And so there is an absolute cultural aspect to understanding music. So um, if we take a look at, let's say, um, within Western music, we take classical versus jazz. There's, there's often some different emotions that can be evoked by, by those different styles of music. And, and they're both coming from a, 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 a Western, though jazz has other influences, obviously African influences. If we look at other non-Western, like let's say Indonesian gamelan music, there, when you ask, you say, why does diatonicism work? Then your question becomes far more complicated because we're dealing with, we're not talking about the same kind of diatonicism. We're not talking about we're not really talking about the same kind of major minor scales when we talk about Indonesian music uh, or the subcontinent of India, North Indian, South Indian music. There we have very different scales. And so your question of like, how can you tell? Um, that's partially going to be cultural is how you can tell. So going back to the question, uh, why does diatonicism work? The answer there is because it does make sense with the overtone series, human perception and psychology. Why can you instantly hear where a note is played out of key? Overtone, human perception is part of it. Cultural, 
is another component of that. Um, and, and the very final sentence there, which says, I guess this must be related to our language. So a lot of people try to make uh, comparisons between music and language. So it's very common to say uh, the first, a first four measure phrase that ends in a half cadence might be considered a question. And then the second four measure, four measure phrase that ends in a perfect authentic cadence would be the answer. So question and answer. And that's an analogy that works very well with language and music. Um, that said, language and music are also absolutely distinctly different things. And so although there are some similarities, sometimes people go too far in trying to make uh, language, uh, there's, there's, there's not a, it's not 100% overlap. It's not like me giving you this, making this video and talking to you, that's not music. I don't care if you, you know, like, if you want to be poetic and say, oh, all sound is music, that's, that's, that's poetic. But if talking about literal use of words and saying this word actually means X versus Y. I mean, like how the reason we use language is to make distinctions between certain groups of things and other groups of things. That's the whole point of language. And it's, it's very, very important. So my talking is not music. It's fundamentally different. And so we have to be aware when we say, why does certain things in music theory work? Uh, sometimes we'll be able to find an answer if we look at language and, and grammatical construction, but at, at a certain point, the, the analogy has to stop. And so we have to be aware of that. Michael has a whole bunch of follow-up questions as well. He asks, is there a relationship between the expectation part and the overtone series part? I sense there is, but they are not the same thing, question mark. So, is there a relationship between the overtone series and expectation? Absolutely. That is a very squeaky pen, but yes, there is a relationship. Um, you can create expectations without the overtone series, like rhythmic expectations, um, formal expectations timbral expectations. So expectation is a very, very big category in, in music, like how we create an expectation in the listener. But in terms of dealing with pitch and harmony, the overtone series has certain expectations built into it. So that's, you know, in part why we have like, you know, these kind of... Yes, there is an expectation after I play this chord of going. That expectation is in part because of the overtone series, also in part because of cultural experience. But the overtone series does play an absolute role in how these notes relate to each other. Keep in mind, music theory is, comes after great composers figured out how music worked. So you go back and step one, human beings are hearing sounds and they hear that pitch sound creates a certain feeling. And so they start trying to figure out how can we put together these pitched sounds to create a melody that creates a certain particular emotion. That's step one. Once they figure out, how, and they're doing that by listening, and like introspecting, I'm like, how do I feel, right? This is what a composer is doing. And when they kind of come up with something, then they present it. And, and if, all, if they got it right, and a lot of people are, you know, feel what they feel that way as well, then it's, you know, it sticks and that happens. So once you do that, then you say, well, wh why does that work? Is there, a, is there a rhyme or reason to that? Is there a formula that I can use to like, you know, re, you know, do it again, re, you know, reproduce that result. And that's where music theory comes in. Music theory is after you've, after a composer's figured out by listening and feeling what works, then they try to come up with the theory behind it so that they can reproduce it. So, because it takes a, you know, it takes a long time to like really listen that intensely, that closely, and, and really be that in touch with your own feelings and how these sounds 
elicit emotions and it's very, very complicated. So you don't want to reinvent the wheel every single time you write a piece. The great composers throughout history, they came up with something new. That's why they're down in the history books. But Johann Sebastian Bach did not come up with something brand new every single piece he wrote. It just, you, you wouldn't be able to make a living. It would, you, he'd have written like four pieces in his entire life if he tried to come up with something brand new every single time. So he figured something out that was new, that people hadn't done. And then he looked at it and said, how did I do it? What's my system? How can I reproduce it? So that he could create other pieces that were variations on that theme using the music theory that he discovered. So I hope that answers that question. Um, Another question from Michael. Why is there a difference between dissonance, tension, and out of key? So put another way, why does a super dissonant chord like the two or the seven diminished triads feel like they, still, they are still inside the key? In a sense, I understand this because they are built diatonically and are heard relative to the tonic, even when it isn't sounded. So let me... this asks us a whole other series of questions and I'm going to take issue with calling the two chord and the seven chord super dissonant. There are levels of dissonance. There's mild dissonance, there's super dissonant. The two chord and the seven chord I don't think fall into the category of super dissonant. We need to reserve that for other chromatic harmonies. So in the category of dissonance And we should define it, okay? So dissonance, technically speaking, from an acoustic standpoint, is a, uh, a complex ratio of intervals. And for example, the, the ratio of the fundamental to the first overtone is a two to one ratio. And this fifth is a three to two ratio in terms of like the frequencies per second. And you can you continue, continue and continue from there. But the more, the, the simpler the ratio, like the easier it is, the, these are consonant intervals. Your, your more dissonant intervals will be nine to eight ratios and things like that. Those are gonna sound dissonance. So dissonance, complex ratio of intervals. Um, to put it into more, more general terms, it's a sense of instability. Notice I did not say it sounds bad, because bad is more of a qualitative term. Dissonance can sound great. A certain amount of instability can be exciting. So we're talking about stability versus instability. And the interplay between them, the interplay between dissonance and consonance. So it's not that it's bad. It's more of like how you use it. What happens to that instability? Where does it go? So this instability uh, is kind of at the core of what we're talking about when we talk about dissonance. So um, we should talk about how these different tones get into these different categories of of consonants and dissonance. So one thing that's worth noting is if you hear a C and a G, which is a perfect fifth, you get another note that vibrates sympathetically. It's kind of like the way the acoustics work. So C and G resonate in such a way to get another C. It might not be in this octave, it's often an octave lower, uh, but I'm just putting it up here for the sake of, of being easy to see. So what can we what can we note of that? Well, two pitches create a third pitch that's one of the pitches that are already being heard. Okay, got it, okay. Uh, let's say, take another perfect interval, a C and an F, which is our perfect fourth. Those two notes resonate in such a way that they also produce a third note. It happens to be an F in this case. Again, not necessarily in the appropriate octave, I'm not writing, but I'm just putting it for clarity. So once again, we have two notes that vibrate such that they produce a 
produce a third note that is one of the notes already being heard. This is your definition of perfect consonants. And in music, we know that we have perfect consonants and we also have imperfect consonants and we have dissonance. So let's see if we can see how that plays out if we continue this idea here. If I hear, I have a C and an E, which is a major third. Yes, it does vibrate in such a way to produce a third tone. It's a G. This is fundamentally different than what we just had here. So with our perfect, perfect consonances, the, the new note, the, the new note that's generated, the resonant note, is a note that's already, you already hear. But in the case of this imperfect consonants, it's a new note, right? So imagine how, how freaky that must have been when people first started doing that. You know, you get two people, they sing a major third, and then you hear a, a third note that nobody's singing. I certainly can imagine why early church music would have said, oh, they, the choir sang so beautifully, the angels sang along with them. They're probably identifying this, this, this phenomenon here where we have imperfect consonances creating a, another note. Let's see, let's see how it carries out, right? So that's a major third. What if we had a minor third? Well, they vibrate in such a way that you get an A flat from the minor third, like that. And what about uh, a major six? And while we're at it, I'm gonna write out the minor six, right? So in a major six, you get an F, in the minor six, you get an E flat. Major six, minor six, right? Now, these are all our imperfect consonances. What can you tell by looking at it? What's the similarity? You will notice that in all cases, a third note is produced that is not being sounded by the instruments. It's vibrating sympathetically. And when you combine all three notes together, you get a major triad. That's a, like, this is acoustics. You know, it's not an accident that the major triad is the foundation of, of music, of, of harmony. It's an acoustic phenomenon. And if you remember, we talked about the overtone series, and you put all the notes together, you get a major triad. So, but you'll notice that the imperfect consonants does belong into a different category than the perfect consonants because of the way it, it, it works. Now, what's interesting is when you have other notes, like let's say C, D, it'll vibrate and produce, I think, a B. I'm not 100% sure. But then what happens is that, um, so it does, it's, it's similar in that sense, but I'm gonna backtrack one second. What's, what's super amazing is when we say, okay, well, we now have this new third note that creates a major triad. So what happens if when this G combines with the C? Well, we know we get another C. And when this A flat interacts with this E flat, we get another A flat. And when this C and F interact, you get another F. And when this uh, C and E flat, you get a, another A flat. So you'll notice that when you start recombining the three notes, because that third note that's resonating is gonna start acoustically interacting with the other note, right? So it'll generate a note and then it'll, it, but what happens is the major triad just reinforces they just reinforce each other. So they just become this one giant. Like if you hear a really in tune major imperfect consonants with major third, it'll sound like a very full triad. It'll sound so full, which is why if you're a composer or arranger, use imperfect consonances. It makes the music sound incredibly rich and full. You just have, you have two people, you have them singing in major six and, and six or thirds. It sounds amazing. Everyone will think you're a genius. It's because of your taking advantage of this acoustic phenomenon. Whereas what happens when, and I'm gonna use the, the colors, right? When we do this with other things, like let's say a, a, a major second, then the, the recombinations start happening and they keep going and they keep going and they keep going. And so they never kind of like, coalesce into a unit, like the, the imperfect consonances coalesce into a major triad. The dissonance 
dissonant intervals never coalesce. They always just kind of like keep recombining with each other and you kind of get like a like a, almost all the pitches at some point just kind of like 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 that. Uh, and so that's where the instability of dissonance comes from. So absolutely, it's related to the overtone series. Um, but it comes in degrees, right? Just like consonances come in degrees, there's perfect consonances, which are super, super stable, right? Like rock solid. Imperfect consonances, they're also stable, but they're, they're not as stable. They're, they got more notes that go on, they got more stuff going on. And then your dissonances are, are another category. But within dissonances, you can go more and more dissonant. So for example, if you're in a tonal key and you have a two chord or a seven diminished, that will not be as dissonant as let's say a French augmented six chord. It's just a different level of dissonance. So I, I would be careful to qualify that. Now, um, the question also says, is there a difference between dissonance, tension, and out of key? And the answer is yes. There's, there are, there are, there's some overlap, and it's, it's a matter of kind of putting them in the right hierarchy. So, tension is broader than dissonance. So, you can have tension cre created by dissonance, by pitches, but you can also have rhythmic tension, which has nothing to do with, with dissonance. Again, we're, we're using words in very specific ways. We're not using them in a poetic way version we're using dissonance to talk about the ratio of intervals and a complex ratio of intervals that creates a sense of in, in, in instability based on the way those overtones interact and resonant tones interact with each other so tension is a broader category uh, that can be created by other means and out of key so we have tension dissonance and out of key has to do with well establishing your key you can have dissonance within the key you can have dissonance outside of the key. Um, and it, it, and it, ask, it kind of like asks you to be aware of the difference between vertical dissonance and horizontal dissonance. Right? So if we talk about a chord, that's vertical, meaning everything that's happening at the same time. So if you're looking at a piece of sheet music, looking from top to bottom, vertical, that's everything that's happening. So if we play something like this, it's a major triad, it's consonant vertically. Now, you can have vertical dissonance, like so for example, if we were to make that an augmented triad, that, that is, has, that's dissonant, some amount of dissonance, certainly more dissonant than the major triad. But we can also have horizontal dis dissonance. So we can have, you could have a completely consonant chord and another completely consonant chord, right? So let's say we call that consonant chord one, consonant chord two. But the relationship between the two is dissonant. Um, so uh, like Carlo Gesualdo is a great example of this. Uh, he was a Renaissance composer. He wrote madrigals. And so he would write something that would be like, mm. Each one of those chords is a triad, right? So it's, and he wouldn't have thought of it this way, but it's like a D flat major triad going to A minor over C, going to B major, like, Major triad, minor triad, first inversion, major triad. These are all pretty consonant vertically. But horizontally, D flat, and D flat major and A minor, they're like very unrelated in the terms of the overtone series. And A minor to B major is also very unrelated. And D flat compared to B, like, so horizontally, so even though we have vertical consonants in this example by Jesualdo, horizontally, it's extremely dissonant. And so there's, there's a concept that you have to keep in mind of both the vertical aspect of harmony and, and consonance dissonance and the horizontal. Keep, keep in mind things like uh, sonata form is all based around the tension between having 
the first part of the exposition in the tonic key, modulating to the dominant for, this, for, for theme two. And then you have this kind of like these warring tonalities and, and how it gets resolved in the recapitulation where in the recapitulation, you finally get to hear the second theme. So this is the exposition. And then in the recap, you get to hear theme one in tonic like you did at the beginning, but you then hear theme two in the tonic. And that is the, that is the, the instability to stability, the, the dissonance to consonance that makes sonata form feel amazing and why it's so uh, potent in terms of expressing emotion. And that's, that's the heart of it right there. You have this horizontal dissonance of the melodies in the key of the one versus melodies in the key of the five. And then finally, when that five gets reunited with its tonic at the very end, all is right with the world. And emotionally, that's so powerful, uh, so satisfying. So keep in mind this broader idea of what dissonance means. It's, it's far, far more complex than just how a, a two chord or a seven diminished triad function within a key uh, and how it progresses. Out of key, um, kind of that's, that's what we're touching upon. Now, I warned you this was a lot. Michael is very thoughtful and thinking a lot about this. So he continues to ask, but let's say we created a different scale arbitrarily choosing six notes of the 12 available. I assume you could create chords within that scale, and I assume you could, with some finesse, create a kind of functionality between the chords, although perhaps not the same as for the major minor scales. If we heard music created, quote unquote, diatonically within this new scale, why would it work? Okay, so we gotta, we gotta analyze this. So, it might be worth uh, noting here that different cultures have different numbers of notes within their scale, right? So when, when, it, when Michael asks about 12 notes, he's talking about the chromatic scale. And we're talking about Western music. So for instance, Indian music usually has more than 12, often has more than 12 pitches per the octave, right? That's a very different system. And in certain types of African music, we'll use less than 12 per octave, 12 pitches. So, so how can this work? Well, you can listen to Indian music and you can ask yourself, well, how does this work? You have all these different, they use different modes. Um, they have different ragas, uh, which have to deal with both pitch and rhythm and certain sequences. So it's a very, very different system of music theory. And it feels different. Like the emotions you feel are, are different ones. Like it's a different culture from a different time. Of course, they have different sensibilities than Western European culture did. So, so to, that ex to the extent that there is a, a logical system that's, that takes into account the overtone series, that takes into account human perception, human, the human mind, yes, you can have other variations of what, means, what's, what, what counts as quote-unquote diatonic. Um, now, Michael used the word arbitrarily. So when you say arbitrarily, um, here you're, it's, you know, you might not get something that makes any kind of logical sense with the overtone series or the human mind. And I'm going to go ahead and open the can of worms that is Arnold Schoenberg and, and face it head on. So. Schoenberg, in, in terms of music history, comes, comes, uh, becomes kind of influential at the beginning of the 20th century. And I would argue that his system does not take into, the, take into account the overtone series 
or uh, the way human beings hear. And so it is arbitrary. And so uh, let me just read a, I'll read a quote for you from, from Schoenberg's writing. This is Schoenberg's own words um, where he talks about his, his technique. Uh, and, and how I'm making the case that this is an arbitrary way to organize music. And so I'm going to use the word organize with quotes, meaning it's not really organization. It's arbitrary. So Schoenberg writes, um, he, talk, he talks about the emancipation of the dissonance. So he says, the term emancipation of the dissonance refers to its comprehensibility, which is considered equivalent to the consonance's comprehensibility. A style based on this premise treats dissonances like consonances and renounces a tonal center. Well, we know from what we were just doing here with how the notes resonate that there's an objective difference between a perfect consonance, an imperfect consonance, and a dissonance. So when Schoenberg says, we're going to pretend, he uses the word treat, but he's really saying, well, I'm going to pretend that the dissonance is equally equal to the consonants. I'm going to treat dissonances like they are consonances. Unfortunately, Herr Schoenberg, they're not. Dissonances are not consonances. Acoustically speaking, objectively, the way human beings hear it. So, so Schoenberg creates this elaborate system of both within his atonal music and within 12 tone that is not comprehensible. It's because it's arbitrary. So you can't, you can't simply arbitrarily choose six notes or whatever and be like, it's going to work. It's going to make sense. It has to have some reference. It has to have some connection to these fundamental overtones. Yes, there can be cultural differences. Yes, there can be subjective differences on what you like or dislike. But in terms of whether it actually works musically, and what you know, when I say works, it meaning it actually has the flexibility to embody and, and elicit a wide range of complex emotions. I would argue that uh, the music of Schoenberg, and not all of his stuff, like Schoenberg knew what he was doing. He was, a, he was very knowledgeable. He knew how to write, um, quote unquote, traditional romantic 19th century music. Some of his pieces are beautiful, and some of them are completely arbitrary and not beautiful. Uh, and they couldn't be beautiful because, because they're arbitrary. Within that, that category, uh, they tend to all fall into one emotional kind of area uh, that's typical of German expressionism, uh, of these sensibilities of, the, of this kind of like world war angst, like this feeling of irrational, I'm out of control, uh, Sigmund Freud, I've got forces in my subconscious that are driving me to do all these evil things and I have to like squelch down the ego, super ego, the id, the id's out of control. I, me as a human being, I'm out of control. It's, everything's crazy. The music of Arnold Schoenberg absolutely helps express that. So in that sense, it, it does express something, but it almost does it from a, 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 a point of destruction, almost from a nihilistic point of view where it's like, Here's music, and if we do not music, so atonal, I know Schoenberg didn't like that term, uh, but atonal is not tonal. So if I destroy tonal, Schoenberg liked the idea of pantonal, all tonalities. But that, that's a contradiction with the term tonal. So it's kind of like this destructive thing. There's a, there is a feeling of, of what it feels like to be out of control, to feel the need to destroy and like find the void. Schoenberg, Schoenberg's quote unquote music, I think fills that. So that's where I'd say arbitrariness. You have to be very careful with how you think about this. Um, music throughout its history has been, uh, up until Schoenberg at least, had been a, a kind of quest for composers to understand how music and sound interacts and creates emotion, the search for knowledge. Um, I can certainly talk more about that. So if you want to hear me talk more about and give more of my reasoning on 
my evaluation of Schoenberg's music and much of the stuff that, would, that he influenced that came after throughout the 20th century, I'd be happy to do that. But I'd like to move on and keep addressing more of Michael's great questions. Um, so keep in mind for us, when we're talking about this music and 12 notes, this is Western music. Where does this go back to? We're talking, we're going back to ancient Greece. This is like the most obvious source, beginning of what we call Western civilization, Western thought. Uh, people like Aristotle was extremely, he was a philosopher. So again, when Michael says, I have some philosophical questions. Yes, you do. These are fundamental, you know, dealing with philosophy, psychology to a certain extent. Um, and so ancient Greece is our, our foundation for that. And you have to ask the question, well, why 12 notes? Why not more? Like, why, did they, why didn't they choose more like the Indians do? Or, or why not less like many of the African cultures did? Why, why that amount? And I think it's worth noting, and I'm not going to get all the way deep into this, that of these cultures, this one developed harmony into the most complex so Indian music has extremely complex rhythm and melodic patterns and structures in the music. Like their concept of melody and rhythm is like super, super, super sophisticated. African music, their sense of, of rhythm and timbre uh, is extremely, like especially timbral, use of timbre and sounds and bending of pitches and, and, and rhythmically, super sophisticated. But neither of them are anywhere near as complex and developed harmonically as Western music ends up being. And so it's a question of like, you know, how many notes can you have? You want to have as much variety as possible. So you don't want to have too few notes without having so many notes that when you start combining them into harmonies, they are just crazy dissonant and that you can't really organize them vertically into harmonies. I think, I, I think that's the starting point to kind of answer the question of, well, why 12 notes? Why did the Greeks decide on that? And, and to be fair, the Greeks didn't necessarily say 12 notes. Um, they, re they really, that kind of developed out of that. The Greeks talk, talked in terms of tetrachords, and they had different kinds of tetrachords, and they did have chromatic notes that got involved with that. But you have all the, what's called modes uh, within coming out of ancient Greece that gets adopted into uh, by the Catholic Church and throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, other factors to keep in mind and, and kind of all of this stuff, just to make it, you know, I could, I could spend hours talking about this uh, and still not scratch the surface, is the development of tuning systems in Western music. So you have things like Pythagorean tuning, but then you have things like just intonation, mean tone. Then you have things like intonation. And we finally get to what, what we have today, which is equal temperament. And what's nice is there's, uh, I have a tuner, an app tuner on my phone. Uh, and it allows you to choose what tuning system you want to use. And if you just scroll through it, like, there's a lot of different options. And if you were to travel throughout Europe and go to these, uh, the, listen to different organs, the big instruments like German churches, abbeys, cathedrals, they don't all have the same tuning system. Some of them are a little bit different. And so these, these overtones, they resonate in slightly different ways. So this was a whole like hundreds of years of like experimentation on like, how do we get the best tuning horizontally and the best tuning vertically and like where do we where do we have to compromise one versus the other to get the best of both worlds um it's a it, the, like the evolution of tuning systems is uh, you know i only know i only know the beginning of that story and there's so much more to learn that that plays into answering um the question um uh, you know, so I'll, I'll keep reading. I'll, let me reread it again, and you can kind of think of all these points I just brought up. 
But let's say, this is Michael, but let's say we created a different scale arbitrarily, which we know is not going to, you know, has a good chance of not working if it's arbitrary, choosing six notes of the 12 available. I assume you could create chords within that scale, and I assume with, you could, with some finesse, create a kind of functionality between chords. Yes, if you choose carefully. Alban Berg was a student of Schoenberg's, and he, that's kind of what he tried to do. He took 12-tone music, and then he tried to, like, finesse it so that it would have hints of tonality, so that it would, like, it would make some more sense to, in terms of the how human beings hear sound. Uh, although perhaps not the same as major. If we heard music diatonically, why would it work? You know, it would have to work because of those, of those reasons we've talked about. Uh, Michael then asks, how is it that we can learn to hear the scale and the tonal center? Well, if it makes sense, um, you're going to be using, this is where your, your ear training and oral skills and solfege, you would, you would then you would then try to hear those relationships. You would uh, you go through all the do, re, mi, fa, sol, ta, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. You would try to modify it as needed. Um, you could definitely do that. Now, if it's, if it's completely arbitrary, um, it's more of a matter of memorization and learning like all your intervals. So you're just going by interval by interval. Um, so when people uh, when musicians perform the you know twelve tone music by Schoenberg or or highly dissonant stuff by Mil Milton Babbitt, um, this is like super hard. These are like incredible musicians because they can't use tonality in the way human beings normally hear sound. They have to be have like memorized all these intervals and how they exactly relate, and they have to be able to like switch almost note to note. So it's extremely virtuosic to, to, to perform uh, that type of, of, of uh, those types of works. Another question. Why does moving down the circle of fifths work, creating the forward motion towards tonic of moving down the overtone series, even when the pitches are higher in frequency than the preceding chord? So this, has to, this question is focusing in why, does, why do inversions work, um, right? Because we know that uh, G C is down a fifth and G C is up a fourth. So we say down, I won't use D, that looks like a diminished, but we'll say down, I'll use an arrow. So this is down a perfect fifth. Is the interval intervalic same? It's equivalent as up a perfect fourth. So why is that, right? So if we had the overtone series, you can see that. But it, it, the overtone series in our ear don't really care so much about octave re registration. Think about if you go to sing someone happy birthday. Let's say you have men and women singing happy birthday. Chances are they're singing in octaves. They're not singing the exact same fundamental. They're singing an octave apart. But acoustically speaking, the octave is so consonant that it that our ears hear it as the same note. It doesn't sound like the women are singing a different different melody or a different pitch than the men, or and vice versa. So the octave is not our ears don't really don't really care too much. Now there's exceptions. And certainly register matters. But in terms of function, whether we go down a fifth or up a fourth, our ears don't care in terms of harmonic progression. They don't. Um, so another question. Michael asks, what would it sound like if we moved up the overtone series in fifths or in fourths or thirds? Is that even possible? Well, you know composers. They want to see, they're going to try everything. Right? And within certain contexts, sure, that's possible. Now the question is, are we talking diatonically or chromatically? Let's assume diatonic for the sake of, of, of ease. And that let's say we're in the key of C major. And I want to go, I don't want to go through the circle of fifths. I want to go contrary. It's going to give it a, it's going to give a different feeling, right? And so for, uh, there might be a point where we want our audience members to feel like something is a little bit different. We're floating. We're not going forward. We're fighting against the stream. We're 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 trying to get some other emotional context. So in the key C major, if we go from a C up to G, up to D minor, up to A minor, up to E minor, let's say let's say we go that far, 
what does that sound like? This is backwards through the circle of fifths, right? This is not the way tonal forward motion. What does it sound like? Well, this is why you should learn how to play piano, to, to answer that question. I'm sorry. No, 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 let me see. So, I, I picked particularly voice leading that was not traditional voice leading. Just so that it had this feeling of like, it's just, it feels like, it doesn't feel like it's going somewhere. You don't know where it's going. There's a, a sense of, I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, so you have that. Well, what if you were to go up in, in thirds? Let's say you went C, E minor, G, or G major rather. Um, and, or let's say you went D minor, F major, A minor. These are, our, you know, here's, a, here's up in fifths. Here's up in thirds. Why did I skip going up in fourths? Because I up in fourths is the same as down in fifths. We, we, you know, as I mentioned a, a second ago, inversions they don't matter. Uh, they don't in terms of function and, and harmony. So you can switch octaves. But thirds and fifths that would be different, right? So. That's the C, C major, E minor, G major. So if we look at tonal harmony, this link, this is normal, but this is not. Right? And if you're establishing a pattern, your ear, the ears, the ear's gonna latch onto that. So just like if we did that in D minor, let's say. The pattern, our ears are gonna latch onto it. It's gonna sound good. But it's not going to sound like forward motion. It's not going to have the same emotion as following the circle of fifths. Circle of fifths feels like forward motion, goal oriented. It feels like in a certain inevitability. This is important. You want that feeling at some point in your piece. Uh, and then one would argue at, at many points. But there's certainly points where you don't need that or you don't want that. And you want a sense of like, oh, something else is happening. Another, another way that composers will often break away from the circle of fifths and, and the traditional harmonic progressions is through using a sequence. And a sequence is two chords that get repeated at different levels, at different pitch levels. So you might say, I might say, I'm going to go... Uh, uh, let me see, let me see if I were to start it, let's say, I'll go. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a sequence both harmonically and melodically. Uh, and this is in one of my earlier lessons, I talk a lot about the sequence. So two chords, you know, have these two chords and then it'll go up, up, or they'll go two chords down down and so a sequence is another way and the reason it works is you're establishing a, another principle that the human ear can latch onto a pattern so up in thirds could absolutely work up in fifths can work it's a pattern just realize that that pattern creates a different emotion than following your traditional chord progressions so um the last question michael you're getting you're getting you're getting so many questions answered you should be you should have so many things to think about. So, last question. Why did we end up with major minor becoming the common modalities? And related to this, why do Greek modes work? They really do seem connected and yet different. Yes, they are, you know, Greek modes, this is where, this is our foundation. This is where all this music theory really begins. So, I have a whole um, uh, Ask Dr. B about music theory. Uh, where I talk about the modes and go in depth. But we have Ionian, uh, let me spell that correctly, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Aeolian. This was a theoretical mode for a long time. No one really used Locrian. The reason they didn't use Locrian is because it didn't have a perfect fifth in it. 
And as we know, the perfect fifth is so important because it occurs so early on in the overtone series. So Locrian for a long time was just a theoretical mode. And these were our main modes. They had a, they had a designation where they would change the range and like what notes got emphasized by using the, the prefix hypo. So you got an Ionian and hypo-Ionian. Um, and the hypo, again, changes what notes get emphasized and the range. But when we look at this, this is a major mode because it has a major third. Lydian is a major mode. Those are our two options. And Dorian is a minor mode because it has a minor third. So is Phrygian and so is Aeolian. These are all minor modes. So why of the two, why of the two was Ionian chose chosen instead of Lydian. That's kind of what, what Michael's asking. And why of the three minor mode options, why Aeolian instead of Dorian or Phrygian? And uh, I don't have a complete answer for that, but it's going to have to do with what harmonies are possible and how you can, like how the harmonies can allow for this forward motion. So if we listen to Ionian, Compare it to Lydian. I did it. I, I did it both on C. So C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C versus C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C. So there's only one note difference, but that that's a huge difference. So what is, how does this work, right? So having the half step here versus here. So half steps are more dissonant than whole steps. We talked about earlier that dissonance comes in gradations. There's not just a one, you know, there's, there's different levels of dissonance. So half step more dissonant than a whole step, vertically speaking. F sharps like to push up to G. They, they kind of push you up. And an F pushes you down to the E. If we're going to start talking about and getting into harmony where we're dealing with major triads, this F pushes us into getting that third of, of our triad. Whereas this F sharp pushes us into the G. So it's almost like a Lydian mode really emphasizes a perfect fifth. Whereas the Ionian mode emphasizes a major triad. I think that that has something to do with it. These, how these tendency tones will lead to certain areas. And certainly as we develop, you have people like Chopin using the Lydian mode. There's a lot of great uh, composers of Broadway musicals who use Lydian, right? Where they're able to use that, that, that very nice colorful, the raised fourth. But if we're talking about how things evolved, the, the, the evolution of music, I think getting into that major triad was kind of like step one. The F natural kind of guided us towards that more so than the F sharp did. And so there's similar things when we're talking about minor modes is like why there and it's interesting like things like phrygian mode uh culturally there's like spanish culture has more use of the phrygian mode they they like that minor second sound so that phrygian minor it absolutely gets used. Yes, first off, we get the Aeolian and Ionian become our major. Those are the, the representative modes for major. One for major, one for minor. Um, and it's really interesting to kind of look at it from a historical perspective. And at some point, there might be a Dr. B music history. Uh, and and I, I'll go from ancient Greece all the way up to present day talking about how the music evolved and having a 
a good theory background is going to be very valuable as you go and look into music history for yourselves. So I hope you enjoyed this lengthy, aesthetic, philosophical, musical discussion. Uh, please, please leave comments below. Thank you.